Heavenly Father, we thank You for Your Word, for the way that You speak to us in it by Your Spirit. And we pray that as we read it today, that we would find comfort, perhaps for our shaken souls, that You would remind us of the truth of Jesus Christ and establish us firmly in it. We pray in His name. Amen. 1 John 4, verses 1 to 6. Dear friends, Do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, but every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world. You, dear children are from God and have overcome them, because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. They are from the world and therefore speak from the viewpoint of the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God, and whoever knows God listens to us, but whoever is not from God does not listen to us. This is how we recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. You know, there are all kinds of spectrums in our lives. There are all kinds of spectrums. We might think of the spectrum of of big and of small. And these things are relative. They are subjective spectrums. On one end of the big spectrum, you may have a mountain. On the other end of the small spectrum, you may have the, the smallest grain of sand. But we have little mini spectrums within our larger spectrums. You know, on the human spectrum, we can go from small like an infant to large like Goliath. We can say Goliath is big, but you put Goliath in front of a mountain and Goliath doesn't look very large any longer. So we have ideas in our minds of of spectrums. There can be others. There can be spectrums of holiness, spectrums of musical ability, of humor, and this sort of thing. But one spectrum that's in view specifically here in this passage is the one between gullibility and skepticism. You're probably familiar with the, the concept of gullibility. A gullible person, if you point to the rooftop and say, there's an alien spacecraft landing, will look around in horror because they haven't thought about it. They just gullibly fall for it. On the other end, you have those who are skeptical. They don't really believe anything you say, regardless of how feasible or not it may sound. John is writing, John is writing to this church or this group of churches that are his audience to strengthen them and encourage them away from being gullible, away from being so prone to listen to the claims of the false teachers, and likely as well to encourage them at how they have resisted these claims and they have stayed firm. They they have already tested them against the gospel, staying firm in faith in the real Jesus. And if you recall from the last time we were together in 1 John, which happens to be about four and a half months ago, there was a time of chaos and confusion in the churches. Because in this time, some had left who even seemed to be leaders in these churches. They had left and they began preaching a different message, a different gospel. And they brought with them people as well who believed this message. And then they began to claim that they were receiving visions of different sorts and that anybody who didn't follow them wasn't really a true Christian. And so there's confusion and there's chaos and there's a sense of abandonment. And wouldn't that be the same way here? At least I would think it would be if I started teaching something totally different than what you've been taught about the truth of the gospel and some of the elders began doing it as well and we left to form our own group and others left and we claimed to have visions and said all the rest of you aren't Christians, it would at least cause some, some upset in the congregation, some confusion in the congregation, certainly a sense of abandonment and disappointment. And so that's what's going on here with John's churches. And John writes to them to encourage them. But who are they to believe? Who are John's church members to believe? If you go back just a couple verses to the end of chapter 3, 
John had already given this instruction, and this is his command, to believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commanded us. But there are two different groups who are preaching two different Jesuses. And how are John's friends, as he says, how are John's friends to know which is the real Jesus? Well, that's where John picks up here in verse 1. He says, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. He begins here again, in this new section, and he says, Dear friends. Now remember that John is the best friend of Jesus. And so if John, the best friend of Jesus, calls you his friend, you're just one degree of separation away from being a literal friend of Jesus. Now, I I think it would be a very high honor if John the Apostle, Jesus' best friend, were to call me a dear friend. And so he reassures reassures them of his affection for them, and then he proceeds to give them an instruction. Test the spirits. Don't fall for everything. Don't fall for just anything that you are told. Test. This is what they are in need of. They are in need of testing. Not that they themselves need to be tested, but they need to test whatever messages that they are being told. And isn't this true in our old day? In our own day, we are bombarded with all kinds of messages trying to tell us what is true. We have magazines and TV shows and self-help things. And then, of course, this is true in Christian literature as well. There are all kinds of those who would preach, who would write, who would advertise the guys on the television, and they all claim to teach truth. But we need to test and see what is true. Not every writer, not every preacher, not everybody on the TV is worthy of listening to. And so we need to test to know who it is is telling the truth. The Apostle Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 5, 20-22, do not despise prophecies, but test everything. Hold fast what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. As one commentator said, evil reveals itself in false teaching. But this idea of testing, this isn't a strange thought to us. We do testing all the time. We might not think about it, but we do testing all the time. If your friend drives up in a pickup truck and you're supposed to get in and you're supposed to go somewhere and the pickup truck has three mostly flat tires and smoke coming out of the hood, you test it in your mind and say, that is not good. I'm not getting in that. If there's a boat that doesn't float, you're not going to get in the boat. If the food is rotten and has mold all over it, you test it and you say, I don't want to eat that. This is how we live. We live in a constant state of testing. And this should be true as well in our minds and in our souls. We should live in a state of testing. Is what I'm hearing true or is this a lie? And John says that this is far more important than testing whether your food is good or rotten. Because whether or not the spirits that you are listening to, whether or not the teaching you are listening to is the difference between life and death. So he wants us to test. But by what standard are they supposed to test? That's what John gets to here in verses 2 and 3, the first part of verse 3. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the third test that John has given his churches to put up to determine who is really a Christian and who is an imposter. The first test was a moral test. Is the person walking in the light? God is light. Is this person walking in the light? The second test was the test of love. God is love. Does this person love the brothers? This is the third test. The third test is a doctrinal test. Does this person confess that Jesus came in the flesh? If yes, they're from God. If no, they're not. Now, this is not the only doctrinal test, right? This is not the only thing. As if we should listen to everybody who says that Jesus came in the flesh. If somebody comes to you and says, Jesus came in the flesh, and you got to eat 32 black jelly beans in order to be saved, just because they say that Jesus came in the flesh doesn't mean that he's a true speaker. What's in view here is that this was the point of division. 
Those who had left were saying Jesus had not come in the flesh, whereas John had said he did come in the flesh. And in fact, John claims to have seen him, claims to have seen him eat, claims to have seen the holes in his hands and in his side. And those who were denying that Jesus came in the flesh, they were doing so not based on Scripture, not based on the, the proclamation of the apostles, they were doing so based on philosophy. Because in their own day, there was a very simple equation of philosophy, and it went like this, physical bad, spiritual good. And so they said, because physical is bad and spiritual is good, God, who is spirit, would never take on a body because he would profane himself. Therefore, he really wasn't human. He really didn't come, at least not fully, in the flesh. But John says that is a lie, and it is contrary to the gospel. He defines this in two ways. First, positively, those who teach this, those who teach Jesus came in the flesh, they are from God, and those who do not negatively are not from God. And those who teach the truth have the Spirit of God. Those who do not have evil spirits. And this is the testimony that John gives in his Gospel. In the Gospel of John, back in chapter 15, John records for us what Jesus had taught Himself about the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, but when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. And you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. Jesus had said this to, among others, John. And so he had said to John, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and you will bear witness about me. And John has told people that what he bears witness about Jesus is true because he has the Holy Spirit. And God does not talk out of both sides of his mouth. He does not say one thing to one person and say the opposite to another person. But God speaks the truth. Therefore, John speaks the truth. And therefore, anybody who speaks a message other than what John speaks is a liar. And if the Holy Spirit says one thing and somebody else claims to hear something by a different spirit, then that spirit is evil and this spirit is good. So how do you test what is true? Well, you test what it says according to John's own teaching as given by Jesus. Now, history repeats itself. Sometimes for the better and sometimes for the worse, and this is true in the church as well. John would combat this error But it wouldn't go away. It would pop up again through history time and time again. And there are other errors that are made about Jesus as well uh, throughout history. There, There is the error that He's not fully human, but then there's also the error that He's not really fully God. And thankfully, over time, the church decided we need to clarify exactly what it is that the Scripture says about Jesus. And so to do that, they wrote creeds. Now, we're very familiar with the Apostles' Creed. We're becoming more familiar with the Nicene Creed. But a third one that I find very helpful, the third ecumenical creed that we accept, is the Athanasian Creed. And the Athanasian Creed speaks very plainly about who Jesus is and the truth of it. So I want to read just just a, a small part of that. The Athanasian Creed says, Now this is the true faith, that we believe and confess that our Lord Jesus Christ, God's Son, is both God and human equally. He is God from the essence of the Father, begotten before time, and he is human from the essence of his mother, born in time, completely God, completely human, with a rational soul and human flesh, equal to the Father as regards divinity, less than the Father as regards humanity. This is the Catholic that is true and unchanging faith. One cannot be saved without believing it firmly and faithfully. It is a big claim. One cannot be saved without believing it firmly and faithfully. So we should ask the question, why? Why is this so important? And it's because man sinned, therefore man must become righteous, and man must become righteous by the work of another man. Paul says this in Romans chapter 5. He says, as one trespass, that is Adam's sin, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, 
so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Did you catch that? The one man made all disobedient. The next man made them obedient. It had to be a man. As Paul says other way, other, uh, another place, he had to be the second Adam. Man sinned and so man had to suffer the consequences. The author of Hebrews says this as well. Hebrews 9, verse 14. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of a defiled person with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ who through the eternal Spirit offered Himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Man needs to be reconciled to God. We separate ourselves from God by sin. And the only way to be reconciled is by obedience. The problem for us is that that ship has already sailed. We are disobedient from the moment of conception. You don't have to teach us to sin. You have to train righteousness. You don't have to train sin. Sin comes very naturally. If you've had a child or if you've been around children, even little ones, you don't have to teach them to scream when they want to get their way. They do that all on their own. We are sinful from the moment that we are conceived. And we need to be made righteous. And we can't be made righteous, the author of Hebrews says elsewhere, by the sacrifice of animals or of this kind or that kind. The law wasn't given to animals. The law wasn't given to angels. The animals didn't sin. And these angels didn't sin. We sinned and we have to be righteous. And the only way to be righteous is for someone to come and be righteous in our place. Someone of infinite value. Praise the Lord. Jesus is a man and as God of infinite value. Therefore, when He suffers, we are saved. But He has to be a man. Otherwise, it's of no use to us at all. So that's why John says this is so important. Because a Jesus who is not a man is a Jesus who cannot save. It's like we might picture it like this. John says that he came in the flesh. This is, uh, for those of you who are grammar nerds, this is a a perfect sense. It's not just that he came in the flesh and then he left, and left in spirit. He came in the flesh and he stays in the flesh. Jesus is forever a man. Because he is one of us, he is qualified to pray for us, to intercede for us. He takes, we might say, in His divinity, He takes the hand of God with one hand and He takes us with the other and He brings us together. He is the mediator between God and man. Because He is one of us and because He is God, He can do both. But again, in short, if Jesus isn't a man, then we are not saved. And if they are to teach, if these false teachers teach a counterfeit Christ, and they are teaching no Christ at all. And they offer no hope. So John wants his people to put their trust, their faith in the real Jesus. This is something that we need for ourselves today as well. We need to avoid the counterfeit Christ. And we need to find the real one and only trust in Him. And we need to be able to discern which is which. Now, like some of you, I expect, I I was very uh, amused and uh, uh, very excited by Pastor Daniel's illustration last Sunday night. He was talking about two truths and a lie. If you weren't here, you can go back and listen to it. But one of his, one of his fun facts about himself is that he played pickup basketball with Shaquille O'Neal for 30 minutes when he was younger. He was playing pickup basketball in the Y, in walk Shaq, one of the greatest players in the history of basketball. Shaq asks if he can play ball with them. He plays ball for half an hour. That's really neat. Now let's say that, he, that Pastor Daniel tells that story. Another guy comes up and tells, I had that same thing. I played ball with Shaq too. And you say, well, tell us about him. Well, he is a, a 5'11 white guy, real agile, and he shoots free throws really well. No! Shaq is over seven feet tall. He's a black man. As far as basketball players, he's not very agile, and he couldn't make a free throw to save his life. The one guy is fake. He's a fraud. 
He doesn't have a story worth telling, and he certainly doesn't have a story worth listening to. And this is how it is for us. We need to be able to discern who the real Jesus is and who the imposter is. And the only way to know that the fake shack is fake is if you know what the real one. The only way to know if the, if the fake Jesus is fake is by knowing the real Jesus. But how will we know? There are all kinds of fake Jesuses out there. The Jehovah's, the Mor- the Jehovah's, Jehovah's Witnesses, the Mormons, uh, they have Jesuses who aren't divine. The liberals have Jesuses who, who aren't just the, all, there's all other means and, and ways to have fake Jesuses. The prosperity gospel Jesus is like a, a genie in a bottle. He'll give you whatever you want if you just give the guy who's preaching it enough of what he wants. And so we have all kinds of false Jesus. How do we know who the real one is? Well, the best way to know the real one is to really get to know the real one. You know, I was talking about this and heard about this somewhere recently. There are people who are specifically trained to be able to identify counterfeit money, counterfeit bills. And, and their, their job is to find out which are the counterfeits and bring them out of circulation. And how are they trained to do this? The, the U.S. Treasury doesn't find all the possible counterfeit types they can and put them all on a big board and say, guys, all right, study all thousands of these different kinds of counterfeits. That way you'll be able to recognize them. That's not how they're trained. The men are trained to look at the real thing, to know all of its ins and outs, all of its contours, all of its unique features, all of the holograms, all of its everything. And because they know the real thing so well, inside and out, when they see a fake, they know it's a fake just like that. That's how it ought to be for us. You can study every fake Jesus the world has ever come up with, and that would be just fine. But the much easier way is to get to know the real Jesus so that you avoid all the others. And that's what John wants for his readers here. He wants them to know the real Jesus, the one who is worth trusting. Move on then into verses 4 and 5. You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. They are from the world and therefore speak from the viewpoint of the world. And the world listens to them. Another address of endearment, this time dear Children, wouldn't that be fun to hear again from John? But then he goes on to say, you have overcome them. Seems a strange thing to say. I don't suspect many of the saints in John's churches would have felt much like they had overcome. But they had overcome. They had won. They were already victors. And how had they won? They had won by resisting temptation. Really, they won by not doing much of anything. The false teachers wanted them to leave. They wanted them to start doing new things. And these saints in John's church said, no, we're staying. We're not doing anything new. This is very much like Jesus' victory in his own temptation. The devil wants him to do things. Worship me. Turn the rock into bread. Throw yourself off the temple. And Jesus said, I'm not doing any of that. And he has victory. These saints have victory by staying firm in the faith given to them by the apostle. Again, they really do nothing. You know, the Old Testament is a a treasure chest of good examples for New Testament truths. And I was thinking this past week about Hezekiah, King Hezekiah from 2 Kings 19. Hezekiah, one of the good kings of Judah, he finds himself in quite the pinch because the Assyrians were, were there. The Assyrians were this, this mighty, brutal, nasty empire, and they seemed unstoppable. Wherever they went, they won, and they laid waste to everyone and everything they came. And the Lord used them to destroy the people of the northern kingdom because of their wickedness. But Sennacherib, the king of the Assyrians, he wasn't content just with the northern kingdom. He didn't say, oh, that's good enough. I'm, I'm going to go home. He goes plowing through the southern kingdom of Judah as well, where Hezekiah is king. And as he goes, he loots and he burns and he sacks and he destroys everyone and everything he could find, all kinds of cities and fortresses. And finally, he comes to Jerusalem. And his army circles the city of Jerusalem. And there's Hezekiah and the people of God shut up in the city. 
Hezekiah, or sorry, Sennacherib himself, there's this great archaeological find, all kinds of information about ancient Assyria. You know, for many years, people doubted that Assyria really ever existed. It was just a a myth. And all of a sudden, they find this this great place. And they find records that Sennacherib had made himself. And he says of himself that he shut up Hezekiah like a bird in a cage. But he never got Hezekiah. Because the prophet Isaiah comes to Hezekiah and says, do not do not fret. The Lord is going to take care of them and He's going to take care of you. And so Hezekiah and the people of Jerusalem wait. And one day they wake up and the Assyrians are gone. All that's left of them is a bunch of dead bodies. Because they had run back to Assyria just like the Lord had said. And the Lord had said that once they get there, Sennacherib is going to be slain and his own children killed him as he worshipped his false god. What did Hezekiah do? Really nothing. He only trusted what God was going to do. His victory was won for him by someone else. He benefited, he overcame by the power of God. And this is what we have here as well. These saints, they're not really all that great. But their Jesus is great. And they have a victory. They overcome by the work and the power of Christ. John, Jesus says in John 16, In the world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. They might not have felt like victors. But if a hand-picked apostle and best friend of Jesus tells you that you are a victor, you are a victor. Just think of the, the confidence that would have given them for their shaken souls. They didn't feel like it. These words are good for us today as well. I suspect that there are many of us who don't feel like we have overcome very much at all. Perhaps we feel a lot more like losers than we feel like victors. The world seems to close in on us and the darkness comes nearer and nearer and nearer. We say with the words of the song, the wrong seems oft so strong. We deal with doubt. We deal as well with enemies. We suffer defeats. We fail to resist sin. And perhaps we see those that we loved and trusted wander away from the church and from Christ. We don't feel victorious. But John says it doesn't really entirely matter if you feel victorious. It matters whether you are victorious. And you are a victor if you are in Christ. Paul says this another way. He says, thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. I want us to see one more thing before we close. And that is that there is no compromise in John's mind. And there is no compromise in John's theology. There is truth, and there are lies. There is good, and there is evil. There is the real Jesus, and there are all kinds of fake Jesus. And you have to find the truth and you have to trust the real Jesus if you're going to have life and life eternal. But when we have Him, when we have Him, we have the Father. When we have Him, we have God. And I picked just part of that song, the wrong seems oft so strong. The real words are, though the wrong seems oft so strong, God is the ruler yet. He rules the world. And if we have the real Jesus, He rules us and we have victory, even if it doesn't feel like it. In faith, we win. And the devil always loses. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank You that You have given Christ, that He did come in the flesh as a true man to save true man that He came as one of us to save us. 
that as we have been plunged into sin by Adam, so we have been raised to new life by the second Adam, the Lord Jesus. And we confess we don't always feel like winners, perhaps especially now in our cultural climate, we often feel like losers. We feel like we're on the outside looking in. We feel further marginalized, and perhaps we feel defeats within ourselves as well. But remind us this day that we are still victorious over all enemies, even over the grave, because we belong to Christ, who is the King. Let us fix our eyes and our hearts upon Him and trust none other. We pray that you would give us this strength and this wisdom. In Jesus' name, amen.